Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> morning, Brian. I said, I did say good morning. I did say, yeah. Um, welcome in. A couple of brief housekeeping items. Uh, it was our culture before. Uh, past couple weeks, we've allowed coffee, Gatorade, soda, orange crush in the sanctuary. <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> if you look down, you notice we have new carpet. Yay! So we're looking a lot better. You may have also noticed there's a little bit of a aroma in the air. We smell a little bit better. I think it's because we are no longer sitting in our own pew. <laughs> it All doesn't right. get better. <laughs> I'll, I'll focus on playing the piano instead. Why don't you stand with us and sing? <clears throat> Oh, yeah. 
have a seat for announcements. Grace Bible Church of Phoenix on this very exciting and momentous day that we have here at our church and in our church's history. Things look a little different, they feel a little different, and that's okay. We're excited to be here together. I do want to draw your attention to a few things that are happening in the month of March. This is Man Month. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. We celebrate the men of this church. We believe that a strong we believe that strong men in this church make our church stronger. And so we spend this month emphasizing what it means to be a man as we unpack God's word and what it has to say about that. We look forward to uh, the, the different sermons that are coming this month. We do have a few special events. I wanna also let you know what happened last night. We had a, a men's ministry event here at the church. And sometimes when we do things like this, I was, I'm not sure how receptive our congregation is gonna be to it. I'm not sure if five people are gonna show up or, or 40, and it was over 40, almost 50 men of this church from all different ages, and it was just a really encouraging time to get together and see a lot of men saying, you know what, yes, I want to be a bold man in this church. I want to know what God's word says about being a man, how to be good fathers, good husbands, and how to, to lead this church and to serve this community. And so I just want you all to know, as a member of our congregation, that there are lots of men that showed up and raised their hands and said, you know what, I want to sharpen each other. I wanna be involved in this men's ministry. And we're excited to see what comes from that. I wanna thank uh, Travis and David Behrens and Josh and the people that put that on. So thank you, that was very encouraging. And uh, we look forward to seeing what comes of that. In March, we do have at the end of this month, Guns and Grub, that's happening on March 24th, right after service. That's one of those weird ones where you bring your firearms to at least the parking lot. This will be the safest place in all of Arizona on March 24th. So we we'll look forward to a day, in the, a day in the desert, more things to come about that. We do have Easter in March, so pay attention to your bulletin. We have a Good Friday service at 6.30. And then also on Easter, we'll be having two different worship services. More details will come about that, but that's what's happening in March. Now, if you're looking around, things are a little different in our sanctuary today. We had a really big week as a church. Uh, in this last week, we tore all the pews out. We tore the carpet out. We got new carpet in here. We've got the stages painted. Things look a little different. And it all happened before our new chairs arrived. That's okay. And so I was thinking about, I was a little nervous, honestly, about kind of being, I don't know, maybe silly about let's do a bring your own chair to church. What if somebody for the first time shows up to our church and they see us and they're like, these guys are nuts in camping chairs. I was a little nervous about that. Then I thought, whether you're new here or you've been here most of your life, we all have plenty of opportunities and plenty of places that we're afraid to show what's really going on. We're afraid of our insecurities or showing that we might not have it all together. Things might not be perfectly planned out. What better place than our church family, to just celebrate what's going on, to have fun, to have camping chairs, to say, you know what, this is who we are. So if you are new here, this is who we are. When we have a church project together, we do it together. When we are hurting, we support each other. When we are celebrating, like the birth of our pastor's son, we celebrate together. And when the paint is here and the carpets are here and the chairs are not, we bring our camping chairs. So that's who we are. Be reminded of that if you've been here a long time. And if this is your first time, I think there's no better week that you can be here to say these are some exciting things going on and these are just normal people that like to bring camping chairs to church. <laughs> and some of you didn't bring one. I saw Adam Skelly didn't bring a camping chair. Adam, I brought an extra one for you right here. <laughs> so if you want, you good with the one you have? All right, very good. Would you pray with me as we pray for this morning's announcements? An offering. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this exciting time in our, our church. And it's not about carpet. It's not about paint or anything like that. It's about you've put a direction for this family to, to grow together, to be challenged, to step up together in, in a unique way and to just say, hey, we're going to do life together. We're going to get messy and uh, we're going to sacrifice some of our finances, but we're going to do it all for your glory. So thank you for this time and may this be a special week of memories as we think about uh, this new project that we're going together. 
Lord, for all of the things that are happening in March, thank you for ordaining our, our leaders and giving them direction to um, go through the series. Thank you for this time of year as we think about the death and resurrection of your son, that we have hope for the future in his resurrection and that we have comfort in this life, knowing that you are not a God that stays up in heaven and wishes us the best, but you inserted yourself on this earth to be tempted like we are, to have hunger like we did, to suffer and have pain like we do. But it does not end on the cross. We celebrate Easter this month thinking that you rose again from the grave, that you fulfilled the prophecies about yourself, that God affirmed who you were and that we have hope in the future through your resurrection and through the free gift of salvation that we have through it all. Lord, be with our offering this small gift of sacrifice. May you use it to further your will in this community through the missionaries that we, that we support across the globe. And we just, that uh, we love you. We give as a small token for which you've richly given to us. Be with Pastor Josh as you've given him words and laid on his heart. May they be effectively communicated to us and may we all have open minds and hearts to receive them this morning. In your son's most holy and precious name, amen. All right, kids, you are dismissed. You know the drill. You're already running after Miss Teresa there. Now, before we get into the message, I want to do something. I, was, I forgot to do this last Sunday. I told myself I was going to do this last Sunday, um, but I'm going to do it today. Um, our sanctuary is, besides this Sunday, and probably next Sunday, we're probably not going to have our chairs until two Sundays from now, but our, cha- our sanctuary is never going to look like this again, so I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> All right, everybody smile. Say cheese. Oh, you better believe it. I'm going to do a selfie. (laughs) Let's do a couple of them. Oh, that's... Dan, you you had your eyes closed. (laughs) Just kidding. I I didn't look at it that that closely. So, kind of interesting in here, isn't it? This, This is a great start to Man Month. In fact, I don't think Man Month could have started off better because the first thing that happened on March 1st was Pastor Brent and Katie. Katie delivered their baby boy, Ezekiel Timothy Beefus. And obviously, they're not here right now. And I know some, some people knew the name, and, and I didn't know the name. I was hoping that he was going to name it like Bubba Beefus or, you know, Bartholomew Beefus or something like that. But this is, a, this is, a, this is an awesome name, Zeke Beefus. I mean, isn't that a manly name? You got to see it like that, Zeke Beefus. I, I like nickname him Zeke Beefy. You like that? <laughs> I like it. So, Brent and Katie, if you're watching, two thumbs up. We are very excited to meet Zeke. You got to see it like that, Zeke. Okay. Well, this is the start of Man Month. Today is the start of Man Month. We're going to put some slides up here if I get to them eventually. I guess we'll get to them eventually. But um, I, I want to kind of share with you a history of man month. There it is. There we go. Um, some of you have been through multiple man months. Some of you have never been through a man month. And how this started was I was inspired by reading a book called um, Why Men Hate Going to Church. And it was written at the beginning of the 2000s. And I have, I forgot to bring it out here. It's, it's in there. I'm not going to run in there and get, the, get it. You just have to believe me that there's a book that says Why Men Hate Going to Church. And I thought, I, I want to read this book. And even, even though I'm a pastor, I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, yeah, I, yeah, why do churches do this? Why are we not connecting with men? Why are we not encouraging men to be bold and to be brave and to stand up for, for what God has called us to do? So I read this book and it's like sometimes churches, they fail to reach men with their deepest needs. And some of the things that men love is risk and reward. We, we, we rise to challenges or, or accomplishment or heroic sacrifices or action and adventure. You think about what are the most popular movies about? Someone, a hero who overcame incredible odds to, to, to save people and themselves. So that's, that's something that really speaks to a man's heart. And so my inspiration from reading that book was What can we do as a church to really encourage men, to elevate the role and responsibility that men have within the church and within their families? So I came up with Man Month. And our first Man Month was back in 2011, and we did a few different things that were a lot of fun. Uh, We said, no women on stage, no women in the kitchen. And I think the women really liked that. 
We said, no women in the kitchen, and we had man meals, and so we made hot dogs and nachos, and we had uh, pancakes and sausage, and we did all those fun things. Um, I also trained four guys to preach a sermon. And at the end of man month, we had two go in the morning, two at night, and our first time we had a, a chili cook-off, and only men could bring chili that they made, that only they made. And Steve, Steve McFadden is the uh, inaugural chili cook-off winner by using stag chili. Thanks, we kind of ruined that for everybody. But anyway, and then we had our first ever guns and grub. But back then, we called it pistols and pizza. And we realized we're not buying pizza for a whole bunch of people anymore. They can get their own food. So we named it guns and grub. And, and I realized over the years, I, I enjoyed it. I think many of the people enjoyed it. Um, attendance was even higher during man month. I think also the fact that it's in March, that kind of helped. And I also noticed that many of the ladies, they, they loved it. They, they loved that men were really being encouraged to be strong and to be bold. Well, this year, we're not going to be doing all of those things as we have before, because I've realized in the, in the years past, what we've done is we've had this one fun month, and the inspiration of man month kind of ended with man month. I like to think of inspiration like this. Inspiration evaporates. You know, it just, it's not there forever. And so this man month, we're doing something a little different. And we're going to do some fun stuff. We had the man month kickoff. We got the guns and grub um, and uh, messages that are pointed towards men. But this year, we want this to go somewhere. We want this to not be a single month event. We want this to start something among the men in our church. And specifically, we want to connect men with one another and encourage them to live out their calling as men. So that's what we're going to be emphasizing for these next four weeks. And for several months, I used an acronym. I knew that I wanted to do men are bold, real men are bold. And I had a rough idea of what each Sunday was going to be about. And then a couple weeks ago at the pastor's conference, one of the speakers, um, uh, Professor Matthew Lovren, was speaking on when, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday morning. And his last session was on the topic of gender identity and confusion issues that are going on in the world today. I think everyone is aware that this is going on. And he talked about how through different ages in human history, there was groupthink, meaning leaders are telling the people in the world to think this way, and you can kind of segment it by generations. This generation thought this way, this generation thought that way. And this is something that the world is impressing upon everyone, this idea that Maybe the gender that you were born with is not your true gender identity. And so that's really happening today. And as he's going through this, thinking about man months, something just clicked, okay? Today, one way that Satan is attacking us is trying to confuse the world about our identity. And people lose our understanding. And if they lose their understanding of why God made us as men and women, people are going to suffer greatly, and that's what's happening. And so this first sermon today is to remind us of this. If we, as people, and men and women, this is also for women, what, what, the application here, but if we know and embrace God's plan for us, we have freedom to thrive and bear fruit for God. We need to know our identity. Remember Christ's words in John 15, 8. Jesus said, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So God created us to bear fruit for Jesus Christ. So as we go through this, the entire month, I'm going to really focus on the men, but women, you're obviously going to tell, this is for you as well. You can apply this to yourself without any problems. But our acronym for this week, for this month, is Men. Be bold, B-O-L-D. I'm going to tell you what each of these stand for. The B stands for belong. Men, you belong. You belong as an active participant in God's plan for mankind. He created you with a purpose. You belong to God's purpose. That's what today is about. Next week, we're going to look at opportunities. As someone who is made in God's image who is made for a purpose, there are activities that you and I can pursue that really help us live out our calling for Christ. So that's what next Sunday is going to be about. L stands for lead. One of the callings that God has placed on men is to take leadership positions in the church, in the home, and to lead with love. So that's what we're going to talk about on that Sunday. 
And the final Sunday, D stands for distraction. And once we realize God's calling on our life and what God has made us to be, we need to remove the distractions where Satan is just trying to tempt us to go off in some other direction. So that's what it means to be bold. And we're talking today about being uh, how, how we belong to Jesus Christ. So um, before we get into this, I just want to take a moment and pray for God's blessing on this message and then for the entire month. Dear Father, I just humbly come before you today. I'm excited to be able to preach this sermon series. This is something that you've laid on my heart, and I think it is so appropriate for today because there is so much confusion among men and women and children over our identity. And you have given us our identity in your word. So today as we, we humbly explore this and we read what your word says, uh, may we embrace this. May we really take upon ourselves your calling, your purpose, um, your mission for us. And may the men in this church rise up to the occasion and be bold in these areas of their lives. So Lord, bless everyone who's listening and bless me as, as the one who's delivering these words. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, uh, I was kind of inspired by the last two Sundays. Uh, uh, both President Kemper and President Walker gave you some statistics. You guys like statistics? Well, good, I'm gonna give you some. Thank you for saying yes. <laughs> so I was looking for some statistics that talked about the importance of men in their families regarding their relationship with Jesus Christ. And I found a couple statistics, I'm gonna share these with you. And um, the first one I think was kind of shocking. And I, and I didn't do research into who created this survey, and I know it was done a little while ago, but the survey um, did this. They asked family members who were once not um, active in a church, who were, did, not, uh, did not have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and families that had both a father, a mother, and children, and they did a survey on the impact that one, of the, what, one person in the family, if they came to Christ, how it impacted the rest of the family. And they started with the children. If a child is the first one in a family to place their faith in Jesus Christ, there is a 3.5% likelihood that the rest of the family will follow. Okay? So if a child is the first one, there's a 3.5% chance that the rest will follow. It jumps up significantly when the mother is the first one. So when a mother is the first one in the family to put their faith in Christ, there's a 17.5% likelihood that the rest of the family will as well. And look about the father. This is shocking. It says, if the father is the first person in the family to put their faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then 93% is a likelihood that 93% that the rest of the family will follow. And you look at that statistic and you think, well, that, is, that is shocking and amazing. Is that 100% accurate? Do, you know, how many people did they survey? I, I have those questions myself. And even if this is off, still, the impact of a father and a man in his family is absolutely profound. So men, I want you to see what kind of role and responsibility you have with your family. Another survey, and this was done during the Promise Keepers generation. How many of you remember Promise Keepers? Okay, a handful of you. All right, so this is like 25, 30 years ago. I remember I went to one Promise Keeper event in Chicago, and I remember in Soldier Field with like 80,000 other men singing How Great Thou Art. That was cool. That was a really cool thing. Promise Keepers is done um, as far as that, that movement. But the Promise Keepers did this survey, and basically it was on the influence of a men in the, church, the future church participation of their kids. And so this is what they found. It says that if a father attends church regularly, then 66 to 75% of the children will attend as adults. And you would hope that that would be 100%. But as we saw the statistics from last week, church attendance is declining, church involvement is declining, unfortunately. But if a father is involved regularly in a church, there's a 66 to 75% chance that the children will, as well as they become adults. And if the father attends irregularly, it's a hard word, you gotta say that correctly, irregularly, there's a 50 to 66% chance that the children will attend as well when they're adults. And look at the last one. If only the mother, in a family that has a mother and a father and their children, if only the mother attends, there is a 2% chance of the children attending as adults. That's shocking. And even if this, 
This is not accurate, and there's the skeptic in me that says, who did they ask? How many people did they ask? That seems like it might not be true. But the vast difference between the father's influence and any other situation is significant. And so men, as you're sitting here, I want you to realize your influence, your involvement, your faith, it matters greatly. It matters greatly. So I'm going to say this again, and this is the point of today's sermon. When a man, when a man understands his identity as one of God's creatures, and more specifically, his identity in Christ, then his impact on others is profoundly more beneficial than a man who is trying to figure out his identity and purpose in life outside of God. So men, this is important for us to know who we are and who God has created us to be. And to know who we are and who God has created us to be, all we need to do is open the Bible to the very beginning. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. This is what God tells us why he created men and women, okay? Genesis 1, 26 through 28. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's it. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so just in these three verses, what do we learn about God's plan, his design for human beings, okay? We realize that both men and women together reflect the full image of God. That's interesting. It says both men and women, he created them to reflect God's image. And so I think you could kind of assume that man alone could not reflect the image, the full image of God. He created men and women. One gender could not do that alone. And it's only when together men and women live out their assigned God-given roles that we can fulfill God's plan for mankind. And we need to understand what those roles are. And Satan is attacking this. He's saying, who you are physically may or may not be who you are mentally and socially and, and psychologically. And he's confusing the world right now. So to everyone here, and specifically men, I want you to understand, according to God's creation, you belong. You belong. You were made with a purpose. God created you with a purpose, and God created you with an identity as a man. And roles and responsibilities come with that. And through Christ, you have been adopted into God's family. So men, understand today, you belong. You belong to God's purpose. And Satan is deceiving the world about this. When people do not understand this, it leaves us to try to ultimately create our own identity and our own purpose in life. And when we try to create our own purpose and identity, who do we place on the throne of our heart? Ourselves. When we're trying to figure this out for ourselves, we end up worshiping and adoring and elevating us as the creatures, not our creator. So let's consider, in light of creation, the two most important things that we belong to this morning, okay? So now we're in our notes. This is point number one. The first thing, men, that you belong to, or who you belong to, is Christ. You belong, and specifically, you belong to Jesus Christ. Well, what does this mean? What does it mean to belong to Christ? It means that because Jesus Christ lived the perfect life and he died on the cross for our sins and he was raised back from the dead, if you belong to Christ, then you too will live forever. You will die and rise as well. And that gives our life meaning for eternity. All of our hopes in this life, and we, we have a whole bunch of hopes and some of them are not necessarily bad or good, and as important as they are, all of our hopes in this life, they're temporary. They're completely temporary. But in Christ, we can live our lives in preparation for living for eternity. Let's read some verses that talk about this. Romans chapter 1, 
beginning in verse 1. And Paul is writing to the Romans and he says this. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Stop right there. This is the first way that Paul introduces himself. Does it look like Paul has any ambiguity on who he is and why he exists? <laughs> There's none. He's, this is who I am. This is who I am. I am an apostle. I've been set apart for the gospel of God. Verse 2, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, whom he was descended from David according to the flesh, verse 4, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, verse 6, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you belong to Jesus Christ. He is your identity, and it is an eternal de destiny. And what we do in Christ for for, um, will have eternal benefits. And what we do for ourselves, all of our accomplishments, they will end when this life is over. Let's look at another passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, talking about we belong to Christ. It says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So men, this is your identity you belong to Christ. So when we talk about being bold, we belong to Jesus Christ. I want to ask you all a question. Um, you know, we're all inspired by different people. And if you're like in a, you have a hobby or a special interest or even maybe like whatever field of um, uh, work that you do, you might have someone that has really inspired you and accomplished quite a, quite a few things. And um, I think one person that um, most people in the world know about that has accomplished a great, uh, he's had a great amount of success in life is a man by the name of Jeff Bezos. How many of you know who that is? Jeff Bezos? Okay, yeah, most of you do. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, yes, you do. You do know him. I'm not gonna put a picture of him up here. I'm not gonna exalt him or anything, but anyway. But Jeff Bezos, okay, what, what has Jeff Bezos done with his life? He has not been a slacker, okay? He's done a lot of things. And so Jeff Bezos is the founder and executive chairman of Amazon, how many of you have used Amazon just this last week? <laughs> yeah, all of us, I think, we use Amazon probably two or three times a week. He's the founder and executive chairman of Amazon. Kind of a big deal. But he didn't stop there. He's also the founder of Blue Origin. He builds rocket ships. That's kind of impressive. He also owns the Washington Post. I'm not impressed by that. But anyway, that's a different subject. I think, he just, I think he just bought it. You know, he had so much money. He's the founder of Bezos Expeditions, executive chair of Bezos, Bezos Earth Fund. I'm not sure what that's about. I don't think I'm even going to look it up. And he's also the founder of the Bezos Academy. He's been a busy boy, right? He's, he has accomplished, just from a human standpoint, he's done a lot of things. He's a high achiever. Now, for all of his efforts... For all of his efforts, he has accomplished for himself a great deal of worth. His net worth, according to the Google that I did yesterday, is he is worth $197 billion. Okay? He has, he has been an inspiration for a lot of people with his work ethic and all the things that he's done. He's worth $197 billion. Now, um, I don't know if there's any billionaires in our room, so I, I, I think it's kind of hard for us to kind of understand or comprehend how much that is. That is. So I'm going to break this down for you a little bit, and even then it's kind of hard to understand. So if any of us were to accumulate a net worth of $197 billion, and let's say we were doing that every month for 40 working years, your paycheck every month for 40 years and pretend you didn't have any expenses, okay? Your paycheck every month would be $410 million every month. That's more than a mega lottery, okay? A mega millions lottery. Imagine winning the mega millions lottery every month for 40 years. Then you're as rich as Jeff Bezos, okay? 
And what do you do with $197 million? Anything you want, anything you want to do. With Jeff Bezos, that incredible amount of worth is going to become worthless the moment he dies. It's impressive. I mean, it is. It, it's impressive. But it's going to become worthless the moment he dies. And if you're impressed with Jeff Bezos, there's someone else I think is maybe a little bit more impressive. Elon Musk. How many of you know who Elon Musk is? Okay, most of you do. Okay. Elon Musk, and I didn't know this until I Googled it yesterday, he, um, he was the co-founder of PayPal. Some of you might use PayPal. He co-founded PayPal. And in 2002, he founded SpaceX. He builds rocket ships. I guess if you're a billionaire, that's what you do. You build rocket ships. He also was a major early funder of Tesla. I know we got a couple Teslas in our, in our church. Well, actually, in the parking lot. Um, and which makes electric cars and batteries. He became its chief executive officer in 2008. He also co-founded Neuralink, a neurotechnology company in 2016. His net worth is $210 billion. That's $438 per month. It's just kind of beyond our, our ability to comprehend. And just like Jeff Bezos, and I don't know if they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or not, but his net worth becomes worthless the moment that he dies. Without Christ, every accomplishment that we have in this life becomes worthless. Paul talked about his accomplishments. And growing up in the Jewish nation, with all the rules and regulations, Paul had a very impressive resume. Let's read his resume. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, Paul says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And he did. He's not bragging. He's actually he's telling us the truth. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, that's the smallest of the tribes. He almost got wiped out in the book of, of Judges. A Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, I persecuted the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. And then he says this, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So all of our earthly accomplishments, men, we might you know, show and compete with each other and we kind of look up to certain people, but all of them are for nothing if we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and we need to understand our eternal purpose. You know, Paul teaches us of a day that's coming when all of our earthly activities are going to be judged. So let's read that. If we're in Christ, we will face this day when we stand before Christ himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, it says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. That's Paul's calling his identity. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And men... That's what we need to know. If we're going to be bold, we need to know that we belong to Christ and we build on that foundation. Verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And so men, in order to fulfill God's call on your life, we must understand that we belong to Christ. And there is a foundation on Christ that we need to build upon. And if we build on something else, then all of that is worthless the moment that we stand before Jesus Christ. And so men, understand, you belong, and specifically, you belong to Jesus Christ. And we're going to take this a ne next step. There's a step further to this. 
Not only do we belong to Jesus Christ, but then we also belong to Christ's body, the body of Christ. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but in the body of Christ, we also have a relationship with each other. And the church, the local body of Christ, is the primary way that we live out our purpose and identity as God's children. Let's look at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 4, it says, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. So this is who we belong to. We belong to Jesus Christ, and we belong to the body of Christ. And this is great news, because not only now do we have an eternal hope because of Christ, we now have an eternal purpose. And that purpose is lived through the local church. And so men and women, this is what you belong to. And Paul describes our roles within the body of Christ in a very unique way. I'm going to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and of course I'll have the, these verses up on the screen. But before we do, this is kind of a little bit longer section. As we read this, what I don't want you to do is, is read this from an academic standpoint. What I want you to do is, as we're reading this, understand that if you are in Christ, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you, this is describing you and your relationship with each other. That we, together, are the body of Christ. And so as we read this, take this personally. And I mean that in a positive way. Take this personally. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So that means all of us here are connected with each other, and all of us matter. Verse 15. Now we love this analogy. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So every single person in this room has been assigned a gift within the body of Christ. God chose that for you. And if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Stop right there. How many people who belong to Christ allow Satan to fill their mind with this deception? Where they say, I, I don't need you. I don't need this. Listen, we were created to belong to each other. So it says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is our calling, men. This is what we belong to. So men, you belong. You have a purpose. This is your calling. And men, if you belong to Christ, let me just ask this. This is a great month to just really analyze and evaluate where you're at. How are you living out your purpose in Christ among Christ's body? Well, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about in the months to come or the weeks to come. But this month, what I hope that will happen throughout this month is that every man, 
that attends the service here will truly consider his relationship with Jesus Christ. But men, understand, you belong. You belong. You belong to Christ. God created you to belong. So belong to Jesus Christ and his church. So be bold. That's what it means to be bold. And I love 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. All right, so the next three Sundays, what we're gonna do is we're going to um, look at three actions that we as men need to pursue that help us to live out our calling as God. And that's the opportunities that God presents to us. And that's the wonderful thing about church. Church naturally creates opportunities for you to live out your calling. And also the, the, the action of leadership in your roles and your relationships, whether it's in the family or the church or society, but then also um, the action of pursuing, eliminating the distractions from our life. So men, I hope you're ready. I'm excited to challenge you. And hopefully all of us will really take upon ourselves this calling in our life. But before we go... I think maybe the most important question to ask everyone here is this. Do you belong? Do you belong to Jesus Christ? Because there's only one way to belong to Jesus Christ and have that eternal hope and that eternal calling. And that is to realize that you cannot earn your favor with God. You cannot earn your salvation. It's only through Christ's death and resurrection that you and I can have the hope of eternal life. And so if you're here today and you realize there is an eternal purpose that I have not grasped or grabbed a hold of, and I realize that it's in Christ and only through his death and resurrection I can have that. And if you've never put your faith in him alone, I encourage you to do that today. Today you can be the, to be the day that you know that you belong to Christ and to his family. And the way that we do that is simply by doing exactly what Romans 10, 9, and 10 says. It says very clearly that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And I know most of you, maybe all of you, have prayed a prayer like this before, but if today you're here today and you realize that you have not, but you want to grab hold of the identity that God has for you in Jesus Christ, you can put your faith in him and know that you belong. And so I want to lead you, if you've never done this, but you'd like to do this today, in a prayer where you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And if all of you would just bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'll lead anyone here in this prayer. And if you want to put your faith in Christ, just simply pray this. Dear God, I know I am a sinner. And I believe that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you raised him from the dead so that I could have the hope of eternal life. And at this moment, I place my faith in Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I hope that before you leave today that you will tell someone or tell me. But as a group here, let's close this service in prayer. Dear Father, I thank you so much for the instruction that you've given to us in your holy word. And simply by opening up to the very beginning of the book, we realize why you created us and how we can honor and glorify you. And so I pray for the men of this church, and not just the men, but the women too, who are both made um, equally in, in the, the likeness of God and we bear his image together. But I pray for the men that this will be a month that challenges them to pursue this calling and that the calling will be to serve you, but then also to do it alongside their brothers in Christ. And so for the next three Sundays, Lord, as we emphasize that, and we try to get men connected together so that they're doing life together, that you will bless our efforts and you will bless us as we humbly seek after you. Uh, be with us now as we go our separate ways. We're excited to come back and learn more about you again next week. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now let me close with a benediction. And today's benediction is from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21, which says this. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Be bold then. You are dismissed.